So hello and welcome back to the show. Uh, my guest today is one of my huge role models, Joel Salatin. We'll be talking about mainly how to source like high quality pork, but the underlying message of the podcast will be just food production practices in the U.S. in general. So basically like I grew up on a biodynamic farm in Ukraine, and when I moved here from Ukraine to the States um, and I walked into a supermarket, I thought America has mastered biodynamic farming. I'm like, wow. I could have, because I didn't know the difference between, like, I didn't even know factory farming existed. So whenever I walked into a supermarket, I'm like, man, they've definitely mastered biodynamic farming if they can produce this much food. But then I think like three or four years ago, I ran into a guy named Paul Chess and a video on YouTube called Dirt Facts. And that video basically gave an underlining kind of theme of food production practices in the U.S. And it kind of woke me up to see that there is like a huge difference between uh, food that's produced, for instance, at, at the supermarket or factory farm food and biodynamically, uh, biodynamically produced food. And then kind of to research Further, I ran into Joel Salatin, my guest today, which I'm very proud of to be uh, speaking with, and I kind of used his Joel Salatin semester series as like a blueprint or like a, a, a light tower to kind of gauge at good food production practices. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Salatin. Thank you. Thank you again for being a guest. Thank you for having me. It's my delight. Yes. Yeah, so for the reader, um, you know, purchasing pork is a very popular meat product, like a lot more popular than beef in the U.S., and I kind of wanted to talk to you today about just pork production practices and basically kind of, um, I guess, giving the reader enough knowledge to make the best choice in terms of what kind of pork they should be buying for to optimize their own health, whether it's pork at the supermarket, the factory farm pork, or organic pork, or whether it's pork from a small local farmer in the various production practices of that. So I guess my first question to you is kind of, can you describe to the reader kind of the production practices that go into the typical, like very cheap factory farm pork you would typically find at the supermarket? Yeah, well, the um, those systems, of course, are in all in confinement. The animals are never, <clears throat> never outside. They never see sunshine. They never get fresh air. Uh, they're on, and they and they never can root in litter. They're always on a, a, some sort of a slatted floor, so their manure and urine goes down into a slurry pit underneath, which of course um, uh, exudes ammonia up. And so they're, it's like living 24/7 in the in the cap of a bleach bottle. Um, and and uh, and of course, you know, footing becomes an issue because that that. Uh, those slats, that slatted flooring, uh, it makes it difficult for them to, to gain footing. It's not like the soil. It's not like uh, you know a solid, solid footing situation. So you got you know that's <clears throat> that's a that's a beginning of it. And then of course they're they're massive houses. They're not little fifty pig houses. They're you know two thousand, three thousand, five thousand in a in a house. The sows are kept in very, very small uh, crates in individual little pens. They're not communal. They're, each one has its own little uh, pen, um, sometimes so small that they can't even turn around. So they, they literally are, can stand up and, lie, and, and sit down, uh, just lie down in the same spot, stand up, lie down in the same spot. They can't even turn end to end or, or anything like that. <clears throat> They're... Um, Many, uh, most I would say now in the uh, big farms are artificially inseminated. There's no natural service, uh, and of course they're given all sorts of, uh, you know, hormones and things to synchronize their heat cycles so that a whole bunch can be impregnated at one time. You know, just to, to do batch, um, batch work like that, and um, so then they're they're bred, and then they, of course, they stay in the same crate. And then they have their babies, and um, uh, the, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's the same situation. I mean, the babies can um, run around a little bit, but the, the babies go to one side, and they nurse, and the sow can't uh, really nuzzle them or do anything because she can't even turn around. 
so she can't do any of the rag, regular maternal instinctual things that a, a mother would do for nosing, licking, uh, smuggling, you know, all those kinds of things. And um, then a lot of times in the industry, those pigs, even as early as uh, four weeks, even less, three weeks, three weeks are weaned. And uh, and then they're put on a special, you know, high um, high octane ration to get going and given shots and all, and, and their their tail is cut off uh, to make it a little bit sore, so that when they get into their cells, and so these pigs will be put in cells of oh I don't know 50 to 100 pigs in a cell, and it's very very crowded in that cell, and because there's nothing for them to do, they get bored easily, and so they pick on each other, and cutting off the tails, making the tails tender because they're a little bit wounded, um, it makes the makes the pigs move away when somebody uh, bites on their tail, so, uh, move away quicker, you know, so they don't, uh, so that the, the biter doesn't draw blood from the bitee, because if if in this very bored, high stress um, situation, if one of them does begin to bleed for some reason for a wound of any kind, often the others will literally eat him. I mean, they are omnivores, so they'll cannibalize, actually eat the um, wounded party, and um, and that's that. And so then the the pigs grow up in these uh, pens and. When they get big enough, 240 pounds usually is kind of the, the industrial uh, desired weight. Then they get they get processed by the thousands and welcome to the modern industrial pork. And can you talk about kind of like you mentioned that um, the species specific diet of a pig is kind of like an omnivore diet? But can you talk about the type of diet like a non-organic like factory farm typically imposes on these pigs yeah well uh i mean the the diet that the pig gets the, the, the pig the pig doesn't get anything really but protein and calories they, they don't get grass they don't get bugs they don't get any of the you know uh whatever bark and things that they would normally get you know caterpillars and wor worms and whatever they would normally get if they were outside. Even even uh, you know our pigs gnaw on rocks. They they enjoy gnawing on rocks. They get some minerals and um, just why do they gnaw on rocks? I don't know why they gnaw on rocks. I just know that they enjoy it. And so none of this natural behavior or nutritional uh, supplementation gets added. So the you know the the feed is a concentrate minimalist. Um, you know, least cost simplified feed to you know, keep the pigs alive, make them grow as fast as they possibly can, and get the highest feed conversion possible. And in terms of their feed, I mean, is it still like, uh, is the industry still heavily reliant on like GMO corn or soy as the primary source of feed for these operations? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that's, um, yeah, that's 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 standard practice. Um, genetically modified organisms are ubiquitous within the industry, and the pork industry, of course, um, is in with the the grain industry, and so they all they all went to the same school, they all drank the same Kool Aid, and so the idea of uh, of GMOs being wonderful is is all part and partial of the program. Yeah, and the reason I bring that up is because a lot of um, a lot of people these days do kind of suffer from like joint issues or uh, like depression or anxiety or, for instance, cancer is a big one these days as well. And I think like it's important for readers to understand that when, um, like for instance, an an omnivore like a pig, for instance, is basically fed predominantly nothing but corn and soy. This kind of like offsets the natural balance of like omega three and omega six. It kind of shoots the omega-6 way up, causing, like, a lot of inflammation in people that kind of, like, eat that type of meat on a daily basis. Of course, it's not the only source of inflammation. Like, um, low-grade stress is a huge 
huge component as well, but it's just like another thing that adds into the equation. So Sure, and, and, and beyond that, there's, there's mounting evidence that the GMO grains are different. And when I say different, I don't mean different in a good way. I mean they're just – they're different, uh, harder to digest, uh, even even some implications toward either infertility and or um, uh, spontaneous abortion, uh, different things. And so I think that we have not yet seen that whole that whole thing play out. I think we're still discovering and learning. Um, some of the ramifications of these uh, uh, frank franken crops. Yeah, and even the stuff that's more obvious, like obviously uh, the GMO corn and soy is grown with like a tremendous amount of glyphosate, and there has been a tremendous amount of research showing the negative health effects of getting exposure to that, and that kind of passes down to the kind of like the organs, the fat, and the meat of the pork, and then people that eat that also kind of get exposure to that as well. So. Yes, that that's correct. Yeah, it all it all adds up. You know, uh these these things are cumulative. And um and you know, whenever anybody in the in the industry whenever tests are done for for FDA licensing or anything like that, whether it's pesticides, herbicides, uh, I mean glyphosate, GMOs, anything like this, they're always all the tests are always done in isolation. Uh, we're going to test one product, one item, and we're going to test it in isolation. But in the real world, they're never used in isolation. They're used as cocktails. Uh, we mix mix things, and you mix your GMO corn with the glyphosate, and you mix it with the chemical fertilizer. And, 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 and so in, in nature, uh, in, in actual practical outworking, um, none of these things that have FDA approval – are ever used the way they're used in the in the testing procedure, and I, I think that's one of the most uh, whatever unknown, unspoken realities in the entire food and farming sector is this notion that not a single approved product is used in practice the way it was used. In testing, that's that's just a, it's just a profound truth, and one that should give everybody pause. Yeah, and usually, uh, what you mean by saying that is usually the quantities they use are like far exceed that what they use in a controlled laboratory. Is that correct to say? No, well, I don't know. I don't know about the I don't know about the the the, the volume. I'm just saying that they're that in testing the they're used singular singularly. And in practice, they're used uh, plurally, and so so um, that that's where that's where the testing is actually not accurate to the practical working of it. You don't you don't use you don't use a pesticide in isolation. You use it in as a rela- in a relationship with um, a chemical fertilizer, maybe with a with a weed killer, an herbicide. And and we call we call this in practice we call this cocktails. So you're you're, you're building you're accumulating a cocktail of of interacting uh, chemicals, and in 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 testing that is never the case. In testing, it's all the the, the item the product is always tested in isolation, without regard to other things. And and so the testing is never accurate to it to practice. Yeah, so I'm guessing like uh, if they use let's just say like five different um, biocides growing that GMO corn, yeah. then trace uh-huh. amounts of that is going to make it. Then the pigs are obviously going to eat that. Then trace amounts of that is going to be deposited into the kind of the organs, the fat, the muscle fibers of the pork. And the person that eats it is also going to get exposure to those like five or six or seven. Trace sure. amounts of different different biocides, and I guess it it really does add up when you get exposure, especially to all sorts of other environmental toxins these days. Well, probably not no, you, since you're living in such a pristine environment, you know, which kind of like I admire, but the average person. 
Yeah, well, well, I mean, the, the, then you add, so, so that's going to go in a person's uh, body and, and ingest it, and then it's going to add with maybe the person's on some, uh, you know, heart medication, or maybe they're on some medication, or they've got, uh, maybe they're maybe they're uh, living in a in a place that has some sort of environmental uh, issue, you know, air pollution, smoke. I mean, so so then, then you get that whole. Then, then you get that whole uh, additional layer of, of of things that the the body brings to the table as well, and before you know it, you've got a whole a whole cornucopia of you know interlocking, interlinking um, negatives. And can you uh, also, in regards to kind of like different chemical inputs in uh, factory farm produced pork? Can you kind of uh, go over the uh, quantities of um, antibiotics used in, like, factory farm produced pork? Because I heard, like, they could have, like, up to 7 to 15 different types of antibiotics, like, per operation that they cycle through. Is, is that true, like, those quantities? Mm. You know, um, to tell you the truth, I'm not extremely well-versed in, in, what, the, um, in what the industry uses because we don't raise pigs that way. We don't use the products. I mean, I see a little bit of the literature. I see the advertising. I mean, the I, I, I do get the uh, I don't know I don't know why, but I get the pork checkoff magazine, and um, which is of course the industry the industry uh, mouthpiece, and I do flip through it and look at it, and I know that it's basically financed by uh, drug companies, and they've got everything from drugs to keep a piggy from getting diarrhea to uh, making a pig ovulate on time to uh, you know, reducing infection. Um, I mean, uh, there's there's a slew of them, and I don't know them all. I don't know how many of them are used, and I don't know what the residuals are. Uh, but but you, you can be sure that they're pretty. Um, you know, they're pretty. They're pretty far out there. Can you give any input? I know, like, when you go to the supermarket and you kind of look at the label, they say, like, no drugs or no drugs or steroids used. But can you kind of give an input of, like, the sneaky nature of if it's even used in the industry anymore, if, like, ractopamine is used anymore? Yeah, I know. That was real hot about five or six years ago. And um, I'm not sure if it's if it's in or out now. Um, I, I just don't I just don't live in that world. So uh, I can't give you definitive information on that. Uh, but as far as labeling is concerned, um, there is all sorts of clever speak around labeling, like natural or um, the reason that they that they put they they can't put drug free is because pigs do emit. Drugs. You can't say hormone free because pigs do make hormones. You and I make hormones, and so the um, you know, in its wisdom, the uh, FDA won't allow somebody who has a completely, um, I'll just say, clean pig from using terms like drug free or hormone free or chemical free. Uh, because we make chemicals in our bodies, the pig makes chemicals in their bodies. That, this is a, this is the kind of parsing that the that the government uh, uh, does, and so you have to say none added. In other words, none beyond nature added, and um, and, and so that's you know that's uh, hopefully means that whatever's in there was just in there as part of the natural uh, body. Uh, but you know things like things like natural things like um, range you know um, range raised well what kind of range I mean uh, organics uh, organics uh, I had a conversation with a guy who was organic certified recently and he said he thought it was um, uh, anti ecological to raise pigs on anything but concrete he raises his Organic pigs in outdoor co- concrete pens, so they have they have outdoor access. And normally, when a person hears outdoor access, they think, "Well, they must be on pasture. They're out here." No, 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 no. no it just means there's some sort of a concrete apron 
uh, with poop all over it that gets sprayed down with water once a day, and the pigs can run around on concrete on a, on a uh, kind of a patio apron kind of thing. Um, so you you just can almost not conceive of the cleverness and the wordsmithing involved in labeling, which is why people like me say, know your food, know your farmer. Uh, the truth is, you don't have to get your meat from the supermarket. You really don't. Um, and there are enough really good, let's put it this way, if everybody who was concerned about it would patronize their local farmer, A, we'd have a lot more local farmers, and B, we have a lot bigger, more financially, uh, whatever, viable uh, local farmers. And both of those would be a good thing. Gotcha. I know sometimes, like, I, I give grocery store tours, and a lot of people, when they to teach people about food production practices, and a lot of times people will come to me and they'll go uh, during the tour, like, oh, I purchased um, organic pork at the supermarket, and I think that's, like, very, very deceptive. And can you kind of give the listener kind of more background of what really goes into supermarket-level organic pork? Yeah, well, uh, it certainly isn't the kind of pork you would imagine it's it's essentially factory you know factory pork uh and even the even the grain used in it which has to be organic certified there's a tremendous amount of fraud in that right now as well uh if you're if you're familiar with what's going on with uh organic grain imports um uh, you know more than 50% of the organic grain used in America is imported, and much of it comes through Istanbul, Turkey, and it comes from the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, you know, the, the, the stands over there uh, in Eastern Europe, and uh, and there's been a tremendous amount of fraud where, you know, that grain comes into port, and somebody puts a few stamps on the paperwork, and it comes in regular and leaves organic headed for the U.S., and this has been an ongoing uh, problem. And so, uh, so you know, here on our farm, we, we get GMO-free. We don't worry about organic certified. That, that has become pretty much a, a, a government, just a government program, and um, with a lot of dubious elements to it. And so we get GMO-free uh, local grain from farmers that we know, and and the batches are actually checked, uh, checked for glyphosate residue and uh, pesticide and chemical residue. So um, uh, there there is a there is in, in many cases there is a I'll just say this a, a more organic option than the industrial organic option in the in the supermarket. You have to realize that that the the regular supermarkets now are there some family small family chains that do a great job yes there are but they're very very small little uh, family family type outfits the average supermarket I mean we're talking about Kroger's and Walmart and Safeway and uh, whatever Piggly Wiggly and uh, you know those kinds of things the big ones um, those their their purchasing practices are such that small-scale, truly authentic, the kinds of producers that you and I would consider authentic, um, simply can't can't get in there. Uh, you can't you can't get the volume, the stipulations at one time, um, all of the sophisticated techno tracking numbers and things like that, and the slow pay. Uh, supermarkets are notoriously slow pay outfits. Uh, often up to 120 days, and so lots of times the vendors actually finance the supermarket. I mean, it's a horrible, it's a horrible system for farmers, and so um, most of us farmers, you know, can't wait to get paid for 120 days because the, the feed mill wants to get paid in 30, and uh, and we just can't run our pipelines out that far. So there are all sorts of ways that the industrial food system and that's the large supermarkets um, creates hurdles 
so that small players, local players, neighborhood players, uh, you know, can't get into them. Gotcha. Well, uh, since you kind of did touch on the subject that there are more sources of meat outside of the supermarket, can you kind of go over, I guess, since factory farm pork at the supermarket isn't that great and the organic pork at the supermarket also isn't that great or healthy for you, but if they do go to a small farmer, can you kind of go over the various types of small farming operations, kind of like, because I know probably there are some farmers that aren't that great, some farmers that are the best or a lot better that produce a lot healthier meat. So can you kind of go over like the various, I guess, levels of uh, pasture-raised pork? Or yeah, if it's even raised on pasture um, because I produce like yeah, some of these small farmers also just raise them in pens sometimes, correct? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, just call it levels of integrity. Um, I would say, let me let me answer the question this way, if you don't mind. I'll just I'll just say, here are things you want to look for. Here are things you want to look for uh, when you go visit and you're you're vetting. When you're vetting your your pork, here's what you want to see. Um, the main thing is that you want to see grass in the pen. You don't want to see a moonscape. Everybody that's raised a pig knows exactly what I'm talking about. Because they can dig so aggressively than a chicken. And, of course, herbivores, you know, sheep, cow, goats, they don't dig at all. And so they can certainly, you know, overgraze something, and you can have overgraze short grass. But a pig cannot only eat the grass, they can actually plow it up and till it. And so uh, so pigs can do a tremendous amount of disturbance that no other animal can do. And as a result, the actual movement, uh, the amount of time, the amount of impaction on a single spot, the movement is what's critical. And so uh, the first thing and the most important thing that I look for in a in a pig operation is where's the rotation how, how fast are they moving the pigs paddock to paddock and and are the and what do the paddocks look like now it's certainly true that when they vacate a paddock it might look torn up but look at the one before then what's the recovery because if a pig i mean if it, if it rains a bunch overnight and soil gets soft Pigs can tear up a lot really, really quick, and it can look kind of rough. Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a, a specific condition, a specific time, specific um, happenstance. So, uh, um, so just because you go and you see a you know a dirt paddock doesn't mean things are things are bad. What you're at, what you're looking for is where's the paddock they came from? How long have they been in here? And and that sort of thing. And uh, because Actually, sometimes it's really good to tear up a paddock. You might be wanting to to plant something different, or 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 even uh, plant uh, vegetables there. You know, let, use the pigs as a plow. So there are reasons to you know to uh, to till up something with a pig. But what you're but but um, you don't want you don't want to be there very long, and you want to see well, what did they do in the previous one? How's it coming back? And uh, and in general, you want to see a mosaic. A mosaic of forage that are that are in that's in paddocks that the pigs have not come to yet that are at rest, and you want to see forage recuperating and growing in paddocks that the pigs have recently left. And so it's all about vegetation, vegetation on the pig paddocks that determines you know whether the pigs are are uh, are being handled correctly or not. Gotcha. And there, is there like a specific, I guess, number of pigs per acre a person can look for, like just to know that it's not like overcrowded or? Uh, not really, because it all depends on movement. In other words, if I'm going to move them every day, I can run the pigs way more uh, densely than if I'm not. Uh, for example, when we first began with pigs, I made a 12-foot, I think, was it? Yeah, I think it was 12 feet by 20 feet. Um, 
I called it the uh, the tenderloin taxi, <laughs> and uh, it was it was it was either twenty by twenty or twelve by twenty. I'm not sure which, but anyway, um, it was just a it was just a, a, a pen that I made on some poles. Just put the poles on the ground, and um, it had a chain on the front, and I'd pull it along with a tractor, and I put four pigs in there. And moved it every day, and if we got rain, I moved it twice a day. And those four pigs in that little area, they would tear up an area in a day. I planted barley and oats behind them and got some wonderful, you know, wonderful stands. Um, and and it, it worked very well. That was high density, but it was very, very short duration. So it makes a big difference. So you can't just say, you know, X number of pigs per acre. It also makes a difference on what your rainfall is. Uh are you on high ground, low ground? What kind of vegetation do you have? Are you are you are you dealing with with annuals or perennials, or even uh, woody or tree species? Um, you know, all of those factors go into it. So I just keep coming back to vegetation. What does the vegetation look like? And uh, and are, are, are the pigs, you know, are the pigs um, st- stimulating vegetation? Are they creating vegetation, or uh, is it is the whole thing turning into a moonscape. And do you have, like, any tips for the listener of, uh, like, what they could ask the small farmer in terms of, like, if they're feeding the pigs, like, a species-specific diet that's going to kind of maximize the nutrient quality of the pork? Well, yeah, you can certainly you can certainly ask the farmer what they're feeding. And, um, and I mean, we, we, give our, we give our ration out to anybody. So you're not only looking at ingredients, you're looking at provenance of the ingredients. So, yeah, we, we certainly we feed our pigs uh, oats and corn and soy, whole roasted soybeans and uh, uh, an organic high lysine mineral supplement um, because pigs can't metabolize lysine out of corn. And so, um, you know, we give them that. We give them some diatomaceous earth as a, as a, as a natural wormer as well. And so we're happy to share our... our um, a ration with anybody, but then beyond that, you want to know well, where did the ration come from? Did it is it is it GMO? Is it uh, you know is it from imports? You know where did it come from? How where, where's the provenance of the feed? So you got you got two issues: not only what is it, but where did it come from? And do you know like uh, do you know if like the nutritional profile of pork is increased if like for instance the pigs are fed like a decent amount of uh, like chicken, for example, or some kind of meat versus, like, uh, uh, grains or the other vegetations or vegetables or fruits you mentioned? If you found kind of, uh, I guess, more of, like, a strict, like, omnivore diet where it's a well-balanced between, like, a decent amount of meat but plus, like, vegetables and fruit, does anyone do that? Well, certainly, certainly gleaning. I mean, <laughs> pigs are scavengers. Uh, you know, pigs... Pigs are closer to us than any other uh, animal, and so they can actually eat an extremely wide range of stuff like people and do very, very well. Uh, for example, you know, in the Alps, in the Alps, pigs are pretty much raised 100% on whey. You can, you can raise very, very healthy, happy pigs on nothing but whey, which is, of course, the byproduct. It's the liquid byproduct from cheese making. Um, back when we used to milk a couple family cows, uh, we always raised a couple pigs a year, primarily on on uh, milk, and we always had extra milk. And I'll tell you what, uh, there's nothing like pigs and milk. Um, and of course, garden garden waste. I mean, from weeds to squash. I mean, pigs will eat uh, beans and squash and and uh, you know, pumpkins. Uh, plenty of people, you know, go and try to uh, scrounge up pumpkins after Halloween, and um, and toss them into the pigs. The pigs will eat all of that. Um, a lot of apple, apple, uh, you know, salvage apples, you know, rotten apples, um, pumice, vineyard pumice, like grape, grape pumice, you know, left over from squeezing grapes that have the seeds and the and the hulls in them. Oh my, pigs will just eat that, just. Uh, up the wazoo, and so um, pigs and salvaged, either spoiled food or food, you know, processing tailings like whey, or peelings and, and pumice and things, 
uh, have been, you know, a, a mainstay of, of pig diet over the years, as well as nut nut trees, nut drops. I mean, the the, um, the reason Virginia, uh, w- w- the the co- the colonial Virginians and the pig industry, you know, they didn't feed their pigs corn. They they fed them uh, the pigs fattened on uh, chestnuts from the American chestnut. And, you know, today we have acorn glens up in the woods, and uh, we run our pigs up there in the fall. And, you know, we can't do it for all of them, but for the fall pigs, uh, they fatten on on, uh, a ration of, I mean, we've had them actually go days in a row and never even touch the feeder. All they're doing is eating acorns, and uh, they're they're beautiful. They're fairly happy. They're very happy and, and do well. So, so a pig is extremely, extremely feedstock versatile, and they are omnivores. But if you get something nutritional like acorns or whey or milk or uh, you know, grape pumice, which has a lot of seeds in it, um, if you get something like that, they can they can do very well on almost a, a single, you know, a single item if it's you know if it's got that uh, if it's got a, a fair a wide profile. And what's the, what's the kind of production time frame between like how long does it take to raise like a fact, like typical factory farm pig versus kind of the way you're doing it? Like from yeah, start to our finish. Pigs, yeah, our pigs. Yeah, our pigs uh, grow probably uh, probably twenty to twenty five percent slower, and um, much of that is because they're they're getting exercise. And uh, now, what's what's really fascinating to me is that one of the things that gives the, so one of the good things that gives pork well all meats. Um, moisture content is exercise. So you know, on a chicken, the drumstick and thigh are more moist than the breast. So in general, when you talk about meat, uh, exercise makes it tougher but moist, and lack of exercise makes it timber, tender but dry. And so I'll tell you a story. My father-in-law, uh, who's almost 90, um, grew up on their farm raising pigs. Almost every farm around here had pigs. They also had, you know, about uh, six to ten dairy cows, and so the pigs were always there to, to get salvage from spoiled milk and things. This, you know, before refrigeration was on every farm and rural electrification and all that. Anyway, his little pig house has a, a 24-inch, a, a two-foot-high threshold. So the pigs would run out in this lot, and um, and they their feeder and shade and water and stuff were in this little pig house. And they had to jump up this 24-inch uh, threshold to get up in there. And I asked, I asked my father-in-law. I said, you know, why? Why didn't you just let them run in there? Why did you put that long, that high thing? I had to jump up. He said, oh, he said because jumping up on that threshold exercised their hams and made the hams way more moist, and uh, and it made, it made them taste way better. Also, the exercise stimulated blood flow, which brought more iron to the hams and, and exercise stimulates the hemoglobin in the blood and, and takes more iron around. And and pigs are very susceptible uh, or very whatever, responsive uh, to that, uh, to the exercise more than almost any other animal in, in making them a lot better. So, um, so the, the ability to get out in the sunshine, run around, and what I call uh, dance and gambol, uh, uh, that that is as valuable for the taste, texture, and nutritional density of pork. Uh, not to mention, you know, happy animal. Um, that is that is as valuable for for the nutritional components and the, as as the actual you know, as the actual diet. Gotcha. And then. Uh, two two more quick questions uh, for the listener. What do you do? What's your procedure like if uh, pigs get sick, for instance? If they get sick? Yeah, I don't know. Do they get yeah. sick in the well, wild? Yeah, or? the the, num- the number one the number one tonic for pigs, um, and the, you know we've used this for years, and I got it out of some old farm books that I've saved. I always look at their you know their old um, husbandry uh, sections. 
And if you get any swine book prior to, you know, it was published prior to like 1930, and you look at the, you know, you go into the uh, veterinary care stage of that book, it will start, um, the first thing it will say is charcoal. And we've made charcoal feeders and just and fed sick pigs or, or you know, poorish-looking pigs charcoal. I mean, in a week, uh, they're the best-looking pigs on the planet. It's just the number one tonic for anything, and pigs love charcoal. They'll eat it. They'll eat it by the handful, and it's really, really good for them. Gotcha. And then uh, the last question uh, before we end the conversation is, do you feel it's still, like, really tough for, like, a farmer like you to compete against, like, these huge factory farms? Do you feel like it's getting kind of worse, or is it getting better? Oh, it's hard to say. I mean, in some ways it's getting better because people know more about about that. Um, if it's if it is getting worse, it's only getting worse because government regulations make it more difficult for you know for small uh, small abattoirs to stay in business uh, because the regulations are, are quite uh, scale discriminatory. They they discriminate against small outfits and concessionize large ones. But I think the I think the actual um, you know awareness among people. Uh, is is better now than it used to be, which is very positive. And um, and and you know, and obviously people like you spreading the word. That's that's a that's a great thing. So I, I think when you say factory pork, you know, the average person doesn't look at you with eyes glazed over like they used to 20 years ago. I think I think there's a there's a growing understanding of what factory pork means. I mean, things like omnivores dilemma. And, Michael Pollan saying, you know, if they put if they put glass on these confinement houses, almost everybody would be a vegetarian, and I, I think there's a lot of truth to that. So, so uh, the, the awareness is a good thing, um, but you know, we still have, uh, uh, you know, price price is a big deal, convenience is a big deal, and just the whole idea that I buy my food from Walmart. I mean, that that's the single people ask me, you know, what's the what's the biggest um, hurdle that we have to overcome and my answer is inertia just inertia the what, what we're familiar with the the power of familiarity the the power of the incumbency is just incredibly strong uh what you recognize name recognition and and uh, we, you know we've we've now created a couple of generations now where you get food at you get food at the store and so we have to we have to de-learn that and completely uh, reinvent where you're supposed to get food, and, and the, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker invested in, nested in the village. Um, you know that's the thing of the past, and, and with Uberization, uh, we're you know we're bringing it back, but it's still it's still a slow, you know, still a slow uphill climb. Are a lot of are a lot of small farmers offering like home delivery now? Because I noticed there are two around where I live in Southern California that have like pasteurized operations, and they offer like home delivery. Is that becoming yeah. like more common to kind of provide oh. that convenience variable? Oh, a- a- absolutely, as well as shipping. I mean, we're now we're now shipping nationwide. So if you wanted if you wanted port from Polyface, uh, we could we could ship it to you tomorrow. Um, and, and so the the logistics of distribution have changed, as you know, dramatically in the last twenty years. Things that would have been completely uh, uneconomical twenty years ago are now actually. Um, actually, in the ballpark, and the and the whole you know bricks and mortar retail interface is um, is struggling for uh, market share and for um, you know for continued credibility in, in the space. And uh, so, yeah, that's where we are, and um, and it'll be an interesting next twenty years to see to see where it all goes. Gotcha. Well, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. I would like to, first of all, like, thank you a tremendous amount for being kind of like a light tower of information for me when I was trying to kind of understand food production practices in the U.S. Because I feel like mm-hmm. you're one of the farmers that really put a lot of effort into, you know, giving a lot of speeches, um, being on, like, for instance, the Joe Rogan show, doing, like, endless amounts of YouTube videos. And that really kind of helped help me navigate, uh, you know, the path in terms of, like, what good food production practices should look like. So I'd like sure. to I'd like to thank you for that. 
And is there like a, is there any website or any sorts of information, like if a listener wants to know more about you that they can go to? Sure. Our, our website is Polyface Farms. That's all one word, P-O-L-Y-F-A-C-E, Farms, Polyface Farms. And uh, you just uh, put that in and it'll, the uh, website will pop up. It's got all sorts of stuff on it, lots of links and, and different things, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Salazar. I appreciate our Thank conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.